Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whichever time of the day it is for you now when watching this live or when reliving the experience with the recording. My name is Frillin Wild of the Open University of the UK, your host for today's Google Hangout brought to you by the IEEE. Today's session is the October 17th edition of a full series of webinars and hangouts that we call Augmented Reality in Your Future. The recordings of the previous sessions are available via the website, which you surely have all seen. The topic for today is augmented reality on the shop floor. And for this, I have assembled a panel of experts in this fast-moving field from across the globe. Thank you for joining us for what will be an exciting discussion. The introduction of technology on the shop floor must be approached in a careful, methodical fashion to reduce negative impacts on product quality, safety to workers, and risks to expensive equipment. The experts I have assembled will discuss the experiences they have with augmented reality introduction to date. Success stories will be shared along with the lessons learned in trials and test bits. In addition to the technical issues, they will frame the cultural and business issues frequently encountered. At the end of this hour, we will take questions from you. If you have any such question or comment, please join the conversation by tweeting to us with the hashtag IEEEAR at any point in time. Now let me introduce to you our panel of experts. Alex Hill, PhD, is the chief scientist at Merlin Mobility, where he leads the development of the web-based augmented reality content authoring and deployment suite, which is called Alchemy which makes extensive use of the Unity game engine. Alex received his doctorate from the University of Illinois at the Electronic Visualization Lab, the birthplace of the CAVE virtual reality room. There, he leveraged virtually virtual reality to prototype the development of augmented reality user interfaces and 3D what you see is what you get interfaces for authoring. Before he joined Merlin, Alex completed a fellowship working at the Augmented Environments Lab at the Georgia Institute of Technology, directed by Blair McIntyre. During his tenure at Georgia Tech, he led the development effort of Argon, the augmented reality browser based exclusively on web standards such as HTML5, CSF3, and KML. Alex has been published in peer-reviewed conferences and journals, including MIT's Presence, Teleoperators, and Virtual Environments in the IEEE Symposium on 3D User Interfaces and the IEEE International Symposium on Mixed and Augmented Reality. He's a frequent reviewer and contributor to AR standards efforts. Our second panelist, Jako Karjalainen, is a research scientist in VTT, the Technical Research Center of Finland, in the field of human factors and complex systems. One of his main research interests is solving issues in information management, skills transfer, and cognitive overload with the help of novel mixed reality applications. Jako is lead developer of the augmented reality job performance aid called ARG, for AR goes HTML, developed by the European Commission funded research and development project TELMI, short for Technology Enhanced Learning Living Lab in Manufacturing Environments, which he aims at bringing better facilities for learning to manufacturing environments as rich as furniture production, textiles production, and helicopter maintenance. He's also involved in the development of a ship maneuvering simulator for Rolls-Royce, and in building a simulator of the maintenance robots for ITER, the International Fusion Reactor Project. And last but not least, Axel Lechtler brings far more than 11 years of experience in business development, augmented reality, logistics, and consulting to his role as a business developer of the augmented reality software company Metaio, which we've all heard of. He gains his industrial background from one of the leading logistics service providers and the European wide acting IT solutions provider in transport management. In his account manager role, his daily work was clarifying benefits and finding the right balance between customer relationships and conclusion of sale. Axel graduated in business administration in Germany and Sweden with a strong focus on IT, logistics, and social economics. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us. To get us started, I want to ask you about the most prominent and best suited use cases you see for augmented reality enabled manufacturing. All of you have been involved in a wide range of industrial projects making use of augmented reality technologies and techniques. Where do we reach most traction? And since there 
can't be a completely upbeat meeting moderated by a person from a northern country as rainy as the UK, let's also be critical. Maybe you can contrast this with use cases where you have seen people fail in the application or in the introduction of augmented reality. Which use cases did work, which use cases did not work, or maybe not yet work? Because if you outline that a bit further, it will help us contrast um, and work out the essence of what the successful use cases are. Is there something like a secret ingredient? What makes these use cases that are successful fly? Alex, can I spin the ball to you? What do you think about those use cases that are successful? Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, I can. OK, good. All right, so uh, for, as far as use cases go, I would say that uh, I think it's important for me to first state what my company tends to do when it comes to augmented reality. What we do, uh, in we're not really trying to tackle the workplace AR for for supporting the actual work yet. That uh, seems to be quite a complex uh, task. So where we've started is trying to uh, support the the assembly, the maintenance. Uh, the instruction of how to the, how to use the equipment on the shop floor or in, involved in manufacturing. So most of the use cases we've been involved in involve we are relatively tight in the sense that we focus on a particular piece of equipment. We get uh, PLM data, CAD data, bill of materials data, and we bring that to the user through augmented reality. So when they we, we track off of the a specific piece of equipment, we do call outs um, and provide that basic kind of information, potentially for part ordering, uh, also for instruction on how to how to operate the machinery. So those are the use cases that I've been involved in. Jakob, can I turn to you um, to quickly summarize um, the experiences you made in the past? Um, you are involved in Tell Me, um, same as I, um, where we looked at a range of different uh, use cases that can be supported with augmented reality. But you have also been involved in a couple of parallel projects, and you also have a history. Maybe you can tell us uh, a few of your trade secrets uh, from your treasure chest. Yeah, I would have to say that I also think that the most use cases are within the assembly and maintenance. And since there are this 3D CAD data widely available, so it's pretty straightforward to do the assembly instructions in the AR. But from the ITER project, we had an interesting case where we could use the 3D models and also bring out the live real-time stati statistics of the machine. So I think the combination of the 3D models and the real-time diagnostics data is quite interesting. The combination of real-time diagnostics and uh, AR is um, what you also are looking at um, at Mitai. Well, I'm quite certain about that. Axel, um, maybe we quickly switch over to you and then return again to Jaco um, to ask him a bit more about the Tell Me use cases. OK, thank you very much, Well, uh, Warm welcome from my side as well. Uh, from my point of view, uh, the most incredible application which helps people in their job better and faster is a uh, production application I've seen 
where a um, special machinery manufacturer is using augmented reality technology. Uh, well, in this case, uh, the workers were supported by integrated information from other systems like a construction system, a system where in all necessary operation uh, instructions uh, and tools are documented and a quality management tool. Well, uh, in that uh, case, workers get all the information they need uh, pointed in their view. Um, they can use different functionality within their application, for example, a, um, to give notifications to, for the processes or for the staff. And uh, for example, they can use uh, with external experts in that case. In total, the application is very large, but also powerful. Um, well, on the other hand, um, I've seen applications sometimes in marketing area uh, where just cu where customer use um, a, a great augmented reality technology, um, but the customer was saving in content. So this application failed totally, in my opinion. And well, coming back to the secret ingredient, I think there is no secret ingredient or anything special, but um, AR is a technology which means that um, you should listen to experts as you do uh, with every new technology. So you talked about uh, one critical thing, um, and that is content is still king if you don't put good content into an augmented reality application, it is bound to fail. But I would like to spin this um, back um, before we return um, to Jaco, I, I would like to spin this back to Alex. Um, what would be your your warnings? Uh, what do people need to pay attention to, and where is a big chance to fail? So, uh, I think the opportunities to fail uh, usually in augmented reality involve, uh, you might say, uh, unrealistic expectations about what the technology can do and about what the return on investment is going to be. Um, my company, we, we develop very high-end uh, visualization techniques for augmented reality. Um, but sometimes these uh, techniques admittedly are not the, they are not the low-hanging fruit that is going to bring the largest return on investment. So for example, um, if you are able to look at a piece of equipment and get uh, through that context directly to the documentation, existing, say, PDF or online documentation for a part or for a procedure, this right there can be some of the biggest gain. Um, so sometimes, sometimes our customers uh, don't they are fascinated by the technology and they don't think about it uh, the way they think about other less sexy technologies. So I would say that, that those are some of the, that's sort of the pitfall is that you have to look at AR, we have to begin to look at AR the same way we look at other processes in manufacturing with an eye towards the type of efficiency and return on investment that they bring. Jaco, you have um, hopefully sorted out your microphone problems by now. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the use cases pursued in Telme? I think Telme has a quite interesting variety of use cases because we are dealing with helicopter, helicopter manufacturing, which is, I would say, a more or less typical use case for AR that they have these 3D models readily available and they are used to all these high-tech things. And then we have IDIMA, which is basically in the middle. They are producing uh, luxury furnishing for ships and they're, I would say, more or less typical SME that they have some material, but not as much as the helicopter pilot, and then we have the tech, uh, 
textile industry use case with Profitex, and that is, I would say, one of the more interesting use cases because it's first you think that there is basically no possible uses for AR, but when you start digging in into the use cases, you find quite a lot of potential problems that could be easily solved by AR. Learning from these industries, um, wh where do you think are, are the, the potential failures? What are things that people should stay away from? Is there something that you could, could contribute? Well, I think that if you <clears throat> try to, if you imagine that AR is what you see in all these concept videos that you pretty much have only rely on these 3D models and it's gonna be this precisely placed overlays and only this high-tech stuff I think if your company is not already producing that kind of material you might end up in problem so I would say that the best way to avoid any kind of problems is to first think that how can you use your existing materials with AR before going into the, I would say, the more sexy 3D stuff. So one of the pitfalls um, that we seem to be facing is if, if people approach um, augmented reality in manufacturing too object-centered, drilling in on a, on a, on a single um, object and trying to just provide visualizations, this is not necessarily where augmented reality unfolds um, its best strengths. It is um, in, in two other things that I'd like to bring up next, um, and that is to do with technical data and technical visualization and processes and support for processes using augmented reality. Um, from, a, from that perspective, I would be interested in your expert opinions, um, which kind of technical data are most suitable, suitable to augmented reality visualization. And what can you say about processes um, that are most likely to be conducive to it? Let's start again with you, Alex, for Merlin Mobility. How can you determine which processes are most likely to benefit from augmented reality? In this so I would say that uh, what happens often is that we we have a conversation with uh, customers about augmented reality and uh, what I have to remind them is that uh, you know the research shows that augmented reality is most effective when a task is relatively spatially complex and uh, so if so we have to sort of steer uh, towards these type of tasks. Uh, if, if it's procedural, then augmented reality, and it doesn't involve a spatial component, then obviously that's not going to be a good fit. Um, now, what my company does do is, is we develop visualizations that uh, are based in part on techniques, not only augmented reality, but also diminished reality. Um, so this allows us to effectively make uh, equipment that you're looking at appear as though it's in a different state. Uh, for instance, uh, a part may have appeared to be removed. Um, I think that this is really valuable in the sense that it allows us to do instructional data uh, that that moves a, a uh, that it allows uh, somebody to visualize what this, the new state of the equipment should be. So we've used this for things like um, rebuilds, uh, assembly, etc. Um, so I think this is a good uh, situation where AR is, is valuable. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I'll leave it at that for the moment. That's two big points. Um, diminished reality and also the need 
for uh, spatially complex uh, processes, um, which sometimes can also be achieved um, thinking outside the box and thinking about how processes can be spacified. Um, I would like to pose this question to you, Axel. Um, how do you at Metayo see this, um, the conduciveness of processes? Is spacification a point there? What about diminished reality? Well, specification uh, is, of course, a, a big topic at Metayo as well. Uh, instructions, as Alex already pointed out. Um, but uh, well, what I see is that uh, we, we have a technology with augmented reality where you can superimpose information uh, on uh, any real object in any position. So uh, you can turn around and this information will always be there where it should be. So uh, we see uh, in different cases different information either if it's in uh, well maintenance processes where you have instructions uh, or if it is in a sampler process where you have uh, maybe some uh, material type information or anything like that. So if we're talking about technical information so we have different uh, possibilities like 3D CAD models or uh, 2D images, technical documents or any videos as well. So um, we do provide uh, the uh, information which is specially needed in that processes. And of course as already said we uh, can support a lot of processes, a lot of different processes with information um, what what is uh, needed in that. So, well, uh, we also provide information like uh, sensor uh, information, sensor-based machine data uh, to any worker who has, for example, to maintain or to inspect any machinery. Um, and that also enables us uh, to, to use different devices, for example, what we may talk about later on. Yeah. So um, I know that you have worked in the past with car manufacturers and um, at the last workshop that we organized in the context of ISMAR we also had um, someone um, from a car manufacturer participate, I'm not naming names now, but they mentioned it is extremely difficult to track for example engine parts or parts in the interior, um, especially if the products are highly customized to the customer's needs. For example, changing the color of the interior or changing the material of the interior. Is there a, a message to be learned um, from that? How, how much does uh, product design have to respect um, the capabilities of augmented reality uh, to be later on be able um, to provide uh, technical documentation using augmented reality systems, maintenance applications, or, or even earlier in the process in assembly. Um, so, uh, yes, of course it matters if there's more individualization or uh, when you're talking about something under the hood to, to uh, give the right information uh, you want to have. So, um, we, we do have several solutions in that, either, for example, uh, tracking anything which is always there and which, uh, where, we, where we can orient us um, to superimpose special information to anything else relative to that position. So uh, that's a possibility. Um, well, on the other side, uh, we, we do try to reduce the uh, possible information to what is needed, maybe by identifying anything else, anything typical, or integrate any, any special information, maybe from the type of car or whatever. Okay, Jaco, I would like to turn to you to get also your viewpoint on what kind of data and um, what type of tasks, processes are most suitable for supporting augmented reality. Well, like I said earlier, I think the 3D data is quite straightforward and easy 
that's quite obvious, but I think that one of the main strengths of AR is the ability to provide information in personalized way. So you could, for example, of machine diagnostics data, you could present it on the actual place in a different way for two types of workers. So I think that is one good use for AR, like we are doing in Tell Me. The last two, three years, we've observed an explosion in wearable technologies. Um, for example, there's currently more than a dozen producers of smart glasses in the market, or close to a release, at least to my counting. Um, we've also seen wristbands, smart watches, rings, beacons, earbuds, whatsoever. They're all promising heaven on earth, um, with a lot of uh, cool and inspiring conceptual videos that sometimes one wonders is this really fact, or is this just fiction? Uh, what's your take on this wearable revolution um, for its application in, in industry, in manufacturing? Are wearables a game changer? Is there a new wave of user interfaces and applications coming that we need to prepare for today? Jako, handing over to you. Yeah, that, that is very hot topic these wearables because I think that in Tell Me where we are dealing with AR on the flag factory floor, the key and most reliable solution would be to put the AR on a tablet device because they seem to be quite functional, but then you come into the fact that you would need your hands also for the job in hand, so the wearables would be nice, but my personal experience is that you you have all these concept videos and nice devices, but to actually find a device that a worker would be able to wear for the whole workday would be at this moment a combination of several devices that I think it's quite sad sometimes that you have a device that has good display, but the camera might be bad so you don't get the tracking and I think that when you move from a, for example a tablet which you are holding a bit further away to a wearable device you basically if you have a tablet interface and you put it on your face it's not going to work so you have to do some sort of modification for the user interface and closer you get to the for example, the eyes and ears, the more precise it should be. And so I think the wearable devices are getting there, but it's not an easy task. OK. Um, Alex, over to you. What's your take on wearables? What are the devices that you recommend to work with? Um, is it a complex interplay of several of them? What's your take? What are your experiences? So we, we like to work with tablets. Uh, there's a, something really nice about video see-through AR on tablets because you have, you know, the, the visuals are nice, but the user interface is a critical part of, of AR. It, it sort of completes the loop, you might say. So being able to touch items, to have a full screen, a screen where you can use your hands is very attractive. Um, but admittedly, uh, we've had some demos where uh, we actually had to have three hands to make things work. So, uh, you know, questions about how you're going to use tablets in the workplace with AR are valid. Um, I do know of situations where people use tablets effectively, where they don't use the tablet all the time for AR, but they but there's a part of the task that they uh, that they need the AR for. So one example is uh, maybe aircraft maintenance. Uh, you find a location the where there's a problem. Sorry about that. You find a location where there's a problem, 
and then you use the tablet to look at it and annotate the problem. So in this case, we're not doing AR all the time. Now, for for other devices, obviously the big elephant in the room these days is uh, Google Glass. Um, we've done video see-through with Google Glass, so we've presented something at the ISMAR conference recently where what we did was we uh, we took the 720p data and we panned and zoomed it to stabilize the video image because it's so small and uh, it has a wide field of view. And you know when you're looking, you move, tend to move your head around a lot. The camera shakes a lot. So we thought this was an interesting way to try and deal with quote AR for uh, devices like Google Glass. One thing I'd like to say about that is that again, uh, if if augmented reality is something that you're referring to, uh, maybe it's showing you what the next step is. Uh, maybe keeping track of what parts you've removed, things like this, then uh, I believe that you can use a device like Google Glass and look up and see the next step and then look back at the work that you're doing. So um, my colleague uh, Thad Starner at uh, Georgia Tech likes to call this uh, micro interactions. So small interactions with AR um, to where you're you're not always doing AR, so I think that those devices can be useful there. Um, obviously, for other types of devices, um, we've done some work with the Moverio from Epson, which is a nice device. It has, uh, but uh, you know, there's a whole host of problems that come into devices that l allow you to see your full set of view or your peripheral vision, uh, and I'm not saying that this device does but then presents information in a smaller area. So you suddenly have the case that people can only see the AR in one portion of their view. So you have a host of new sort of user interface problems where you have to uh, indicate to the user the extent or the, uh, or the window within which they can see things. And, and uh, so it's inherently frustrating. Um, but I think my takeaway on this on the subject is that unfortunately um, the, the the restrictions on workers uh, vision uh, and their peripheral view uh, really makes it a challenge to put AR into the workplace with head mounted fully head mounted displays and that, that's a problem I don't think we've solved because it, it's sort of a problem where, well, when you have the ultimate device, then this technology will work. And I don't think most other fields or, or technical applications or problem solving work in that way. So we've got to find a way to make AR useful even before we have these kind of devices. So that is in part only, only in part a hardware problem, um, at least to my opinion. This is also a question for innovating user interfaces and uh, changing the product design of AR products. Um, Axel, can we get your take on um, on that matter? And um, what types of wearables are you involved in? I mean, there is not only smart glasses; um, there's others that um, definitely are interesting in the manufacturing context. I hear that beacon manufacturers, for example, sell beacons like hell um, to manufacturing companies. And I uh, was wondering if you do any, any related work um, and can share with us your view on, on wearables, all sorts of wearables, not only the glasses. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ferdinand. Um, my thoughts about wearables, well, uh, it is a revolution. Um, you know, my basic is logistics where you have to have a, a hands-free working uh, where it uh, supports you in your daily tasks and uh, where you need something, uh, you can get information, either if it's directly information concerning any orders, any picking orders you have or whatever, either uh, on the other side uh, about, well, 
indirect um, information concerning your work, something like uh, there is another forklift coming from the right side, you have to stop or something like that. So um, I think this is very important to have these variables. So um, talking about what kind of variables, sure, we uh, all know the glasses, um, if it's a Google or a Epson glass or whatever, um, others turning on the market are uh, compared with helmets, which is maybe something for the heavy industries, or uh, even others like wearables, yeah, uh, like uh, um, watches, for example, where you also can have any augmented reality scenario on that, or using it as maybe a, a using the camera of these wearables um, to have uh, well uh, a picture for a video three through. Um, but let me mention one uh, aspect. Um, either uh, Yaku or Alex does ma uh, mention. Um, the way of interacting with the application, with the AR scenario, with the technology will change as well. So as you all know, we have with the Google Glass, these uh, touch panel on the side, we have a uh, additional device with the Epson glasses. But we're talking about other ways of interacting, like uh, using Gster's, um, to, to steer any application. Sure, voice is already here. Uh, you can use it uh, with different devices, with different applications. Um, well, at Mitaio, uh, we do also have another one. Uh, we're talking about a thermal fingerprint, uh, which can be used as a, um, well, uh, as a, a, a way to interact. So you can use any uh, surface you have. Um, uh, the scenario is tracked by a thermal uh, camera and uh, recognize any fingerprint, you do so. So you can augment any keypad or something like that on a surface and uh, we know then uh, what kind of key you pressed. So you can easily interact with that um, well, wearables. So, of course, wearables are a revolution, and I think they'll increase even more. Yeah, there are um, many exciting things coming, and even if um, one of the um, technology is not uh, in the market and uh, right for the market. Um, we're just definitely looking at a very prosperous future uh, with a lot of innovation. Um, a bit more business-oriented, turning to investment decisions. Um, a problem that many manufacturing companies are facing today is clearly the question about the value of augmented reality in manufacturing. And any value discussion is often famously framed with the four different words value, worth, cost, and price. They're often used very interchangeably, but they don't really mean the same. Even more so, um, an investment decision discussion should always look in both directions. What is the value of doing it versus the cost of not doing it? Now you see I'm also playing with the words and uh, yeah, Axel. What is the driving force for the investment decisions you face with your customers? Is it the worthiness, the value, the cost or cost savings, a higher price for better products? Well, in my experience, um, yeah, most decisions for an augmented reality application are based on quality reasons. Um, Nowadays, in, in, in a world with rapid changing, with individuality, in, uh, with individual environment, um, uh, the time to market is essential, essential for most of the company. Uh, and augmented reality um, can positively support uh, that time to market uh, with a increased quality. Um, let me give you some examples. Uh, for example, the uh, development or the prototyping uh, process, AR can show you the well the virtual object in the real environment. This helps you to detect errors in an early stage of the development. Um, 
well, furthermore, it can uh, show any any machinery in any existing surroundings, like uh, what is used for factory planning. Um, this also detects errors in the in the early stage of a product, which is uh, quite important. Um, what when we are thinking about the production or the manufacturing in itself. Um, Giving instructions, as Alex already mentioned, uh, is also uh, a way to um, avoid errors, to um, uh, support the quality, support the quality of products, support quality of work. And um, so, well, also mentioned the, the monitoring process, why you have to inspect something, uh, give any information related to the task to do, uh, so you can um, hold the production up and running. Uh, and that is also possible with augmented reality, so having a, a kind of mobile workplace walking around in the production area and getting uh, all information you need to do your job well. And, well, in the end, increased quality often comes along with cost savings. Yako, yeah, I know that um, you're also working on, on sort of worthiness aspects for augmented reality, as it's not always um, the investment decision to increase the quality of the product, but it can also be a decision about increasing the quality of work and um, the happiness of workers, uh, for example, looking at aspects of safety and uh, ergonomics. Um, can you tell us a bit more about this business angle? Yeah, I think the <clears throat> safety aspect is quite critical because you really can't put a price on worker safety. And, well, if you when you can use AR basically as a X-ray goggle to, for example, a piece of machinery and see something that would be otherwise invisible to the eye, you can give safety information to the user which wouldn't be possible otherwise. And the ergonomics things, well, I think it could be possible to also do some sort of ergonomics check of the user, but I would say that at, with the current state of the variables, I would stay at the level of that you have a piece of some piece of machinery and you can give information that okay this is heavy and you should be careful but if you start doing the actual real-time monitoring of a human you you will end up in very complex cases but there are some examples of already existing but I think those are cases where the safety factor is very very critical because then it's just makes sense that okay costs a lot but we will do it anyway but to have an ergonomics check for all the factory workers on the factory floor not yet <laughs> that can also prevent costs costs of uh, people being on sick leave and uh, costs to the public health systems um, if you live in a country that has something like that um, Turning to our third panelist, Alex, um, what is your take on the business investment decisions? Um, I know Merlin uh, Mobility is particularly well known for the attractiveness of um, the user interfaces you provide. What about um, changing the attractiveness of factories of the future? Right. So. The investment decisions that our customers tend to make, um, it admittedly, one of the big issues in this area is that, um, you know, AR is sexy, and uh, while I think that in the future documentation 
uh, mechanical processes, assembly, diagn uh, error diagnosis. While I think that this is where AR is going, often um, that part of the company that is involved in documentation, uh, instructional data, uh, is poorly funded, whereas the marketing people the, uh, uh, tend to have a lot of money. So um, sometimes decisions get made, uh, you know, based on uh, who has the money, and and frankly, you know, we, many companies have existing processes in place for documentation, and it's uh, sometimes a second thought. Uh, so that's one thing that I see with our customers is that um, sometimes they might choose something that involves uh, maybe visualizing something for a customer to in order to make a sale uh, over something that improves uh, that promises increases in inefficiency but is going to require some significant effort to deploy um, but I should say that you know you asked about uh, you asked about the attractiveness of the workplace for the future I mean, everyone understands. I think that you know we're the the old way of training your employees is uh, on the way out because time uh, the time to market is so fast now. Uh, products change so quickly, uh, and we have new people coming into the workplace who are younger, who are familiar with things like virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D gaming, and so they take to these type of technologies very readily. So uh, I think we have an opportunity with augmented reality to uh, engage those people. But we're not only engaging them, you know, the, the research shows that one of the things that's not often discussed about augmented reality is that if you train somebody using one particular media and then when they go out into the field they they use that same media as a part of the actual real work, then the time to to become useful is greatly shortened. So this is really critical now with, uh, with workers that are not just trained on a particular piece of equipment and then they do that for 20 years. People need to be flexible. So we need to get workers in place on new equipment fast. So augmented reality has a lot of potential in this area um, to be a facilitator for that. Um, and uh, for, the, for the organization, there's a great benefit of having a device in between the user and the work that they're doing uh, for the purposes of, of uh, cataloging and uh, collecting data on what actually happened. Uh, and this takes some burden off the worker, uh, burden of documenting uh, processes uh, and verifying certain things. So this is also increases, I think, the attractiveness, attractiveness of the workplace of the future. That sense um, there, that augmented reality, uh, as you all say, quite definitely has its place in the mix for cyber physical systems of the factory of the future. And um, quite clearly, there is a lot of potential, especially in between um, robots and automation and uh, the workers of the future in which augmented reality will or should play a further in a role, um, maybe to what other people in the field have called uh, heteromation as uh, in contrast to automation. Heteromation being the interplay of humans with advanced machinery, the interplay of the workforce with robots. And um, that is something I send in between the lines of, of your responses. Gentlemen, um, let's wrap up before taking audience questions. Um, if you could, could I ask you to, to give a short takeaway message to our IEEE audience on augmented reality for manufacturing? 
What would you recommend others to pay attention to? What would you recommend uh, maybe even not to pay attention to? Jako, let's begin with you. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, well, I would say that instead of going technology forward, I would start the process of ARification from the actual company processes to get the information flowing before getting the technology into the picture. Axel, can I bring you up next? Um, what's your takeaway message um, to our audience? Well, um, yeah, the takeaway mes message is uh, quite simple. With augmented reality, we're talking about a, a future user interface uh, to uh, whatever you want to do in production. And so, um, if you if you're convenient uh, with augmented reality. Um, what you can do first is look at the examples uh, and try to adopt them on your processes. And uh, yeah, that's that's quite important to have a, a first picture about what's uh, possible with augmented reality. And if you're uh, totally convenient, uh, well, call me and we'll discuss our ideas while drinking a good Bavarian beer. Alex, um, your summary, um, your key recommendation. Uh, well, I would say that it's pretty pretty clear now that that there is a return on investment for AR. Um, the implementation, <clears throat> the technology that will support that, the uh, the cost of producing it. Is still a question, and I get that question all the time. But there's no doubt that in the future, uh, because it reduces, uh, it reduces error, it reduces time of task, uh, it provides the documentation, uh, it's uh, of of tasks, etc. It has so many benefits that I think uh, to anyone observing, I would say it's coming, and it's gonna it's gonna be here. Um, when you look at the trend today towards uh, product lifecycle management systems, their integration with marketing, uh, the production of marketing uh, uh, visuals from directly from CAD data, etc., you, you can tell that this kind of data is this parallel universe of, of information uh, about a product it exists in, and it's increasingly being. Uh, is available within companies, and so to for companies to uh, produce their uh, documentation uh, based out of these systems is relatively straightforward. So I think that it's definitely coming. Um, one other point I'd like to say is that is the word context. Um, augmented reality is effectively about context. It's about taking that parallel world of the digital and placing it in the context of the physical. So if I'm looking at a particular part or I'm involved in a particular uh, instruction to recognize that context either through something like a, uh, a beacon or through a GPS or through computer vision, all of that sensor data that establishes the user context helps to marry the digital with the physical. And this is an accelerant on people's ability to do work and to do it efficiently. So, uh, And it doesn't always require a lot of whiz-bang graphics uh, and computational power. Uh, like I said earlier, just being able to break, to get me to the appropriate documentation at the right time, this can be a real game changer. We have questions from the audience as well. There's uh, one tweet that I see retweeted from the IEEE Standards Association. What about the precision tracking when used, for example, for deviation analysis? Um, who of you wants to take that one and tell us a bit more about using AR to quality inspect, look at uh, deviation of assembled 
goods and products in comparison to their ideal state? Can I just uh, spin that over to you, Axel, for starters? Well, of course. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, um, concerning the deviation process, um, what we try to do is that we we uh, try to to tag surroundings. Yeah, if you um, uh, if you're uh, placing any digital obje object in in that area, we're trying to. Uh, well, track surroundings and uh, and set it in, in a relative manner to that. So um, it is um, it is quite easy to do so and to give uh, a visual information to the uh, user. Then, yeah. Alex, um, what what about precision tracking? What are your experiences? Are there any shortcomings that have to be watched over? Well. <clears throat> in in industrial environments, and I'm and I'm I'm aware that uh, Matteo uh, is active in this area. Um, you, you know, we have two different kinds of situations where we we think of AR. We think of a of a user ad hoc walking up to a piece of equipment uh, or casually looking at it and finding out digital information. We don't need a high precision there, but um, when you're doing manufacturing in a context, um, all you need to do is uh, increase the size of, say, your fiducials, um, uh, have good lighting, and increase the resolution of your cameras, uh, and you can you can get really uh, very high precision. Um, but admittedly, it's more costly, and it's more um, it has less staged for that specific situation. Um, and uh, something that can be done is that you can you can magnify things. So if you're trying to deal with something like uh, watches or uh, something like that, uh, augmented reality can work in this context. Um, so if the, if the image has been blown up for the computer vision, then the accuracy, the resulting accuracy, the deviation, uh, is is blown is increased also or decreased you might say sorry um, sorry to cut that here I think we we had a good answer already to the precision of tracking um, there is another question that I see um, what about the cost of not doing augmented reality if it is a crucial part of the mix of the factory of the future um, there is a cost involved of not being one of the first movers or maybe even late majority, uh, early majority that we're approaching. What about the cost for those people who decide to rather be late majority? Um, is that um, a position that you can validly take or do you at least need to prepare? Um, just to underline that with an example, um, we know of, of several companies um, where people wanted to use, say, for example, the company logo as a marker to launch uh, an augmented reality learning experience uh, or, or augmented reality manufacturing experience, rather. And it turns out that the logo is not trackable because it is uh, see-through or um, it doesn't have any distinct features. Um, that is surely something that could have been taken care of ages ago in some design process, uh, at least keeping the option open for uh, entering the AR market. Um, so, so from my personal perspective, there are um, things that I've seen that people need to take care of, even if they decide to not invest now but later. But what other costs are involved of not looking carefully at that? Axel, can I spin this over to you? Well, uh, that depends on. I think being follower is not too bad. Uh, but if you um, if you can identify a process or task where um, augmented reality may fit, you, you should check this. So, uh, if we're talking about costs, um, 
cost of not doing it uh, may be not uh, that high. As, um, depends on what you want to do. So sometimes it's okay, sometimes not. Um, the um, well recommendation from my side is that uh, make you familiar with that, make you familiar with the technology, make you familiar with what you can do with that, and then check your process. And that's what you can lose. You um, can use lo uh, time. If the conclusion is that you don't have any anything to support, and it's okay, who matters? But if there is anything uh, to do it not, it may cost you time and quality, as mentioned before. Jaco, um, taking you as for a final statement, deliberating between to do it or not to do it, uh, what's your verdict and, and why? Well, like we have discussed that the devices are uh, getting better and better and the things are moving forward and if you are willing to do to take some of the possible pain of being an early adopter, you can affect the future devices, but on the other hand it would be also quite a nice situation to wait and just harvest the good results. So I'm, I would say I'm 50-50 I'm at the moment. I'm afraid this is all the time we've got for today, and we will have to draw this episode to a close. Many thanks to our panel of experts for their time and willingness to be here and share with us their view on augmented reality in manufacturing. Dear audience, don't forget, this Google Hangout is part of a large series of virtual events on the subject of augmented reality that is organized by the IEEE and hosted by Christine Perret. Uh, for more information on the other upcoming events in this series, just go to the IEEE Standards Association webpage, which has the title AR in your future. Thank you for being here, and goodbye. <laughs>